Uh, greetings to all, all our esteemed guest speakers and participants. I, Kritika Mohan, EPWG representative, Northeast Zone ICOMOS India. Welcome you all on behalf of ICOMOS India, international webinar on magical art form and tantric literature of Mayong, being organized by Northeast Zone ICOMOS India with International Scientific Committee on Intangible Cultural Heritage and National Scientific Committee on Intangible Cultural Heritage, ICOMOS India. This is an ongoing effort to unfold Northeast India's Intangible Cultural Heritage Series, out of which we have organized webinars on Borghit and Bihu previously. We'll be planning other webinars to showcase other heritage assets as part of our future endeavors. Mayong, located to the east of the famous tantric cloister, Kamrup Kamakya, present-day part of Morigao district in Assam, India, is reputed as home of dreadful sorcerers. The word Mayang, derived from Maya, means illusion. There is close proximity to the illusory world of sorcery, so people from outside Mayang usually fear to visit this place in the past. Legend says that the early magicians of Mayang were proficient in black magic practices and performed surprising feats by employing the power of their traditional knowledge system. Though the practices of black magic have disappeared, the white magic are still widely prevalent among the inhabitants. There were incantations practiced by the early magicians of Mayang, which were only used to perform for some virtuous feats. Approximately 300 manuscripts of incantations have been found in the village of Mayang. The tragedy is that the modern magicians of Mayang lost the prerequisites of applying the traditional knowledge system that embraces their cultural identity. If one knows something, one keeps it to oneself with great secret, perhaps due to its dreadful effects. Major portion of incantations were preserved in oral form also, and they went to oblivion with the death of the magicians. However, there have been unwarranted changes in it due to modernization, and hence it is necessary to preserve this great intangible cultural heritage at any cost. The webinar is a sincere effort by ICOMOS India and ICICH providing a platform to showcase the knowledge of Mayang as a valuable intangible heritage asset in India. Dear speakers and participants, thank you again for being part of this webinar. Today, the guest speakers in the webinar are Dr. Utpal Nath, Assistant Professor Mayang Ansali College, Raja Mayang, and Professor Dilip Kumar Kolita, Director, Anandaram Borwa Institute of Language, and, uh, Language Art and Culture, Guwahati. There will also be several performances of magic, use of medicinal herbs, exhibit old manuscripts of the magical mantras and others, along with the deliberations. Now, I request uh, Dr. Rima Huja, Vice President of ICOMOS India, to formally welcome the speakers and the participants. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, Kritika. I hope you can all hear me clearly. It is, yes, yes, uh, we can hear you. gives me extreme pleasure on behalf of ICOMOS India uh, to, to welcome all of you. But more than that, I'm so proud of my colleagues because the Northeastern Zone, the um, National Scientific Committee on Intangible Cultural Heritage, and of course, with our colleagues who are joining us from the International, um, uh, International Scientific Committee also. So uh, we, at ICOMOS India have been focusing on a range of different things, but very obviously the living heritage, the intangible heritage is an integral part of anything that we look at. And I must admit, I know very little about what the topic that we are going to hear about today. So I'm waiting. I have read it up, but that's not the same as uh, having a closer insight to it. But what is amazing is that the human mind has been so creative through the centuries. Uh, not only has it uh, looked at the, the natural world around us and modified it to suit our own living conditions, but the creativity has come forth in ways of uh, paintings, poetry, oral traditions, and of course, 
how the mind is looked at, uh, which is what brings us to Mayong, which is what brings us to looking at magic, which is what brings us to the wondrous world and often scary world of how humans thought of the natural and the unknown and the supernatural around them. Once again, welcome to what promises to be an exciting seminar. Uh, thank you to all our participants who are joining us. And it's good evening time in, in, in India, but I think it's morning almost or very late at night for our International Scientific Committee members who are joining us. So once again, a warm welcome to everyone. And it's back to Kritika now, as we look forward to an exciting, again, evening in India, but an exciting event at any rate. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you so much, Rima, ma'am. Now I request uh, Dr. Arun Manon and NSC Councillor iCommerce India to welcome the guest in this webinar. Well, over to you, sir. Thank you, Kritika. It's a very good evening or a good morning to all the participants of this very valuable and rich program that the, the Northeast Zone and the NSC ICH has uh, put together. Looking at the um, program that's lined up and the focus of today's event, I am reminded of <coughs> the um, pagan form of religious uh, activity, religious um, uh, events that happen around the Teyam in North Malabar. This is uh, really an amalgamating force around the family and the ancestral home and, and gives a sense of belonging and completeness to the family heritage and uh, to the place as such. Um, so I do see very interesting parallels between what is um, going to be discussed today. Uh, I, I am an engineer and uh, we've been in architecture training. Uh, engineers, probably more than architects and archeologists uh, tend to be preoccupied with brick and mortar or uh, wooden glass and concrete. Uh, but ICOMAS India and our engagement with platforms such as these give us the opportunity to understand that the intangible elements of our culture is what gives us a sense of completeness and purpose to the tangible aspects uh, of the built heritage. Often ICOMAS and uh, activities of ICOMAS uh, may seem to be architect centric or built heritage centric, but uh, it's these uh, wonderful events that happen uh, parallelly within uh, the ICOMOS family that give an opportunity for different professionals to see the value of um, the various elements of cultural heritage. With that, it's my pleasure on behalf of the National Scientific Committees of ICOMOS India, the Scientific Council of ICOMOS India, to welcome all the resource persons and the participants to this uh, fantastic program and wish all of you the very best in the series. Thank you. Over to you, Kritika. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Dear audience, uh, now we come to the real brainstorming session. And for the purpose, I request our first guest panelist, Dr. Rupanath, to enlighten us with the knowledge of his extensive research on Mayam. Uh, let me introduce uh, Upanath. He is a leading social organizer, pro tourism promoter, nature and heritage conservator, writer, and socio cultural activist, the initiator and the unacknowledged pathbreaker of the tourism sector of Greater Mayam, Pavitra region, and the main brain behind the setting up the uh, setting up of the Mayan Village Museum and Research Center. He is not only a person, but an institution and words won't be enough to describe his extensive work on his years long practical and published works and experiences in the field of tourism, as well as nature and heritage conservation activities in Mayan Pabitara region. Presently, Dr. Nath has been working as an assistant professor in the Department of Economics of Mayang Ansari College, and also offering his services as an adjunct professor, research supervisor in the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of 
Mahatma Gandhi University, Meghalaya. He is also associated with the volunteer works and activities both at international and national level. In the field of literature, Dr. Nath has already earned his reputation as a poet, writer, and dramatist. He had also made a documentary film entitled Mayang or Best, highlighting the magic culture and civilization of mystical Mayan kingdom in 2009. Welcome, Mukul sir. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Kritika Mohan. Thank you so much. Uh, at the very beginning, I would like to offer my thanks and gratitude to the Honorable uh, President, Secretary, and other officials of ICOMAS, and also to the Honorable officials of NSCI CH and uh, ICI CH for giving me such an opportunity uh, to present something about the magical heritage of mystic Mayan. Special thanks goes to engineer Dilip Sankar Koti sir and engineer Sanjeev Krishna, Sankar Krishna Das sir for showing uh, their such deep faith on me and for selecting me for the sim. Uh, without consuming mass time, I would like to start my presentation uh, on the topic entitled Magical Knowledge, Tradition and Practice in the Mystic Land of Mayang of Assam. I uh, request the Kritika Mohan to share my PPT, please. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Kritika. And my uh, topic of my presentation is the Magical Knowledge, Tradition and Practice in the Mystic Land Mayang of Assam uh, from past to present and then to future. So every society has its own heritage of science and technology stored in its traditional wisdom. Although this traditional wisdom appears to be nothing more than mere magic and superstitions, it forms the basis of later development. In a place, Barbara Nassel also opines that interest in practical uses of science came first to magic and superstitions. Today, with little Notice past archives of such knowledge and expertises are spilling into oblivion, him, leaving humanity in danger of losing its past and jeopardizing its future as well. Mass of such expertises and wisdom has already disappeared. And if it is neglected, then most of the remaining could not be passed on to the next generation. Therefore, I think it is very mass essential to explore all the traditional knowledge, expertise, and wisdom elements whether they are tangible or intangible, magic or superstitions inherent in the traditional wisdom of traditional societies. And thus undertake necessary steps for safeguarding this as much as possible before of its disappearance. And this presentation will try to throw a light on the past and present scenario of the study and practices of magic in Mayan. And it will also try to make a prediction about the future continuity of those practices among the people of this region. I will try to make some workable suggestions for safeguarding this part of intangible heritages. Please go to the uh, next slide. And uh, Mayong is located in the west of the district of Morigao of Assam and just beyond to the stern fringe area, very fringe areas of the famous Trantic place, Kamaikha of Kamrup district in Assam. And it lies on the western extremity of the Kolong Kopili Basin, between the mighty river Brahmaputra on the north and the river Kolong to its south and southwest. The word magic is almost synonymous with the word uh, Mayong. I mean, there are an intimacy between the words Mayong and magic. From time immemorial to mankind, the place Mayong has been famous as a nerve center for the study and practices of magic. Once upon a time, the place was reputed as a home of some dreadful sorcerers called Bejiz in Assam. Thus, the name of this place still transports the minds of some local people, or some people, outsiders, to a realm of black magic and witchcraft. There is an opinion that the word Mayong itself had come into existence from the word Maya, which means illusion. Uh, because of the pro close proximity of the illusory world of sorcery, people from outside usually paired to visit this place in the past. With the passage of time, though the practices of black magic had disappeared from the heart of magical Mayong, the practices of white magic are still continued in present Mayong. Uh, please go on to the 
Uh, now I would like to speak something about the concept of black music and white music. Black music refers to those musical practices which are used for harmful or evil purposes in order to put an end to the lives of the enemies or to bring sickness or injury on them. Uh, on the other hand, white magic refers to those musical practices which are generally used not to do for evil, but for beneficial purposes to cure some diseases or to solve some day-to-day -day problems and needs of the people. It is believed that in case of white magic, the ends are achieved without invocation of any dark powers, unlike black magic, rather by performing some magical rites or by reciting some simple incantations or by some sacrificial works. Apart from black and white magic, there are some other types of magic in Mayon, uh, which are uh, actually used neither for any harmful nor any beneficial purposes, but to perform some impossible deeds. Please go to the next slide. Uh, legend says that the musicians of early Mayon were very much adept in the practices of black magic and they could perform some stupendous feats by employing the powers of their magic. As for example, they could convert a man into sheep or a tiger by spelling a few lines of mantra. They could, they could transform or leave a tree into fishes and also hypnotize wild tiger. They could stop the urging of blood and convert the bullets of a pistol or gun into water. They could transform a fired fish into swimming one in a bowl of a curry and also fly in the sky with the help of the mysterious application of magic. They could even kill a man or an animal at will by using the power of their sorcery. Even today, uh, my young children hear some stories of bygone days from their grandfathers and grandmothers to kill a man or an animal or to do mischief to someone's help. The magicians of early Mayang employed a variety of techniques besides employing the power of host or evil spirits. Sometimes the magicians sought various types of invisible bond uh, to uh, their enemy to kill him or to do mischief to his help with the help of uttering certain mantras. Sometimes the magicians made an effigy of their victim or constructed a puppet which represents the victim. Then they shot an arrow made of human bone to death effigy by reciting some suitable incantations. Sometimes they collected a bit of animal snow, excreta, or the hair, nail, or a piece of cloth used by their victim. And by using certain spells of her such objects, they buried this secretly in the compound of the victim's house. Sometimes the villagers collected a number of eggs of duck, and by using certain spells of her these ducks, they sent forth these to attack their victim in the midnight dark. The magicians of Mayang were very much adept in applying these tactics of magic. They knew and practiced some dangerous incantations suitable for this feat, and by using these incantations in a proper way, they enabled to achieve such nefarious in or could also perform some other impossible deeds. Please, next slide. Great. Yes, these are uh, some examples of mantras used by the uh, early season magici magicians of Mayang. Uh, as for example, uh, there is Thumuriban, there was Thumuriban mantra, which is used for shooting invisible arrow like a knife. Uh, there was Tekeliban mantra. Uh, which mantra was used for shooting invisible arrow like a pitcher. Uh, there was, there was Bihban mantra, incantation for the act of casting a pain. Uh, there was also Saktihel mantra, which is used for casting power to attack somebody. Uh, there was Gohoniban mantra, incantation for causing dysentery. There was Zorban mantra, incantation for causing fever. Uh, there was Kajialogwa mantra, incantation for causing quarrels. There was, there was Kamban mantra, incantation for casting the person of sexual desire. And there are so many other, other, uh, other mantras like this. Uh, these are some examples only. Uh, please go to the next slide. It is to be uh, noted that some of these mantras have been found in the form of manuscripts, uh, which are still in the hands of the villagers of present Maya. 
but some mantras were in well oral form, uh, and those went into oblivion with the death of the magicians of those days. Uh, in a survey, we have found uh, more than 300 such old manuscripts of mantras, which were used by the magicians of early Mayan. But the matter is there. The magicians of today's Mayan do not know the ways and prerequisites of applying these mantras inherent in those manuscripts. Uh, there is the possibility that even if somebody knows something, he keeps it in great secret, perhaps due to its dreadful effects. Oh, please go mm, to the next slide. Uh, the, these are these were some magicians of early Mayan. Uh, examples only. There are so many uh, magicians uh, we have found in our uh, manuscripts or in our uh, ancient records. Uh, some of, some among them were Kanta based, uh, Kanta Nath, uh, Kasari based, Zatadhari based, Sutradhari based, Kumar Uja, Kamala based. Sura based. Uh, it is to be noted that these musicians of my own were well versed not only in the application of black music or in performing some impossible, impossible deeds, but also in the application of white music, that is, in the treatment of diseases or to solve many day to day problems or needs of the people. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, there are so many reasons. Uh, for disappearing the practices of black magic from the heart of the magical city Mayong. Uh, the most important among them are the older generation reluctance to pass on their teaching and secrets to the new generation. The reason is that all the famous bases or magicians had a great possessiveness for their uh, supernatural power of magic. And they thought that if they taught everything to others, then their power and name and fame will be declined. Many of those teachings and secrets were in oral form, and those went into oblivion with the death of the magicians of old generation. Some written manuscripts were also burned by the magicians themselves because, because of the fear of pulling these into some under-serving hands after their death. Some manuscripts were destroyed by the family members of deceased magician because even keep, keeping up the manuscripts at home necessitated stick adherence to, the, to some rituals, regulations, and it is believed that not abiding by this was supposed to bring bad luck to their families. As the absence of perfect and dedicated followers or disciples, as the practices of black magic always involves a lot of hard work, patience, dedications, and meditations. Please. We'll pick up, go to the next slide. With the passage of time, though the evil practices of black magic had disappeared from my own, it is observed that the practices of white magic are still widely prevalent among the villagers of today's my own. Majority of, it, of its local people still resorts to the magical way to solve almost all types of their household problems and diseases. About 70% rural folk of peasant Mayong still opts to approach first to their village base or kobiras when they suffer from any ailment or disease. When it is not possible to solve the case for village base or kobiras, only then they rush to their nearest cities like Guwahati, Morigaon, and Nogao in search of better treatment of this scientific age. This place can still be regarded as a living museum of those magical beliefs and practices. Uh, please. Uh, a major portion of white magic practices, which are still current in Mayam, is concerned with the treatment of various diseases. Some white magic practices are also found, which are concerned with the fertility of cornfield. Some practices are associated with controlling of the weather or the like and some are connected with, with the solving of various human problems like misfortunes, love affairs, family matters, et cetera. Uh, some kinds of white magic practices are performed without using any mantras or incantations, uh, rather by performing some magical rites or by some sacrificial works. The magicians of Mayong employ a variety of techniques to perform such kinds of uh, uh, magical ways. As for example, 
uh, when a baby cries too much or expresses some abnormal behavior, then he is suspected to be affected by evil eye and or evil spirit. Uh, and its treatment is done by the act of blowing into his ears. This act of magical healing is known as Hornot Kupdia in Mayong to protect a baby from the evil spirits. It is also believed, it is also advised to hang a torn piece of fishing net with a handful of burned mustard seeds over the doors and windows of the house. Please go to the next slide. Sometimes uh, it is also believed that uh, sometimes it is advised to keep a knife, a sickle, or a few mustard seeds, or a piece of fishing net under the mother's bed to keep the evil spirits away. And sometimes it is also advised to put fish bones in the roof of the house to drive the evil spirits away, to prevent the evil spirit, to prevent the effect of evil eye, and to bring prosperity to a family. It is also advised to collect a piece of old fishing net, a piece of raw turmeric, a big fishing hook, a egg of duck, and a piece of paper, and then writing the names of all the family members on the papers. The items are tied together and buried under the earth in, in the four corners of the house of the family. When a man suffers from the pain of Sikialora, it means the pain originated from displacing the vein in the backside neck. Then uh, it is advised to take a pair of sikia. It is a type of string bag made of loop for carrying loads. It is advised to take a pair of sikia under his pillow for two or three days. It is believed that the performing of this rite can remove the pain of the patients. In order to cure the pain of intestine, an earthen lamp is placed at the level of the patient, and this limb is covered by a ghoti. Ghoti means a, a blank water pot made of brass uh, to cure the patient. Such type of magical procedure is uh, used by the magicians of Mayo. When a baby suffers from rickets, it is carefully, he is carefully allowed to engulf through the trunk of an elephant or to pass below across the belly portion thrice. Yes. Uh, most of the magic practices performed in magician, uh, uh, performed by the magicians of Mayong are always accompanied by some suitable incantations. Uh, the techniques of using different mantras or incantations are different from each other. As for example, in case of curing the disease lumbago, the bases always use an incantation, namely Kokal or Bihijara mantra. Reciting this mantra, Again and again, the visas start to beat the patient with a bundle of the leaves of Bihrikiya plan. And when a man suffers from jandris, the visas use an incantation, namely Harbemar or Mantra. They first collect five or seven leaves of black rum and take a little mustard oil with water in these leaves. Keeping these material sub substances over the head of the patient, they start to recite the mantra, stirring a bundle of dubori grass in the mixer of the mustard oil and water. Uh, we have attached here uh, two videos. Uh, please uh, go to the previous slide, Kritika. Uh, please try to open the video. I have attached here two videos. One is, one is for Kokal or Bihjara Mantra and the other is? I am not able to open it. Okay. Okay. Then, then uh, more further, please. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. In case of the mantras like Bandhmela or Pohobor mantra, which is applied for safe delivery, the veges pass or cut a glass of water by using a knife or sickle while uttering the mantra of hardy water. At the end of the mantra, blowing of air from mouth is done of hardy water. Then a portion of the water so sound is given to the drink, given to drink, and the rest is prescribed to use for bathing by mixing with other normal water. In case of the mantra, like Petor Bihjara mantra, uh, which is used to cure stomach ache, 
Nadi Jara Mantra, which is used to cure the pain of intestine, Kosoka Jara Mantra, which is used to cure sprain, etc. A little mustard oil is charmed, uttering the respective mantra, and it is used to message the disease-affected part of the patient. Some bejes utter these mantras while messaging the effect, effective part with mustard oil. In some cases, the bejes use snake oil, river dolphin oil, etc. in lieu of mustard oil for this act. In case of Bhutpikhas uh, Khera Mantra, which is used to reveal spirits like Bhutpikhas, etc. The mantra is matard over a fire. In this method, dry silies, mustard seeds, etc. Uh, um, were placed to the fire while muttering the mantra. Uh, and it is believed that the smell uh, emitted from the dry silies and mustard seeds burned in the charmed fire can cure a patient by driving away the effects of any evil spirit. Please go to the next slide. Uh, these are some photographs of magic practices of peasant Mayong. The first one uh, is Narijara Mantra, process of Narijara Mantra to cure the pain of intestine. And the name of the magician here is uh, Sri Tuleswar Nak. The second one uh, uh, is a view of practicing mantras for curing headache. He is uh, preparing a zap or zori by using the uh, Murar Bhikjara mantra to cure headache. And the uh, third one, which is in the middle portion, uh, the name of the musician here is Sosindana. He is uh, using the Harbadhak mantra, which is used uh, to prevent all types of misfortune and diseases. And the fourth uh, photographs, uh, it is a view of using the Bankata Mantra, which is used to uh, uh, prevent the injurious incantation. And the fourth uh, and the last photographs, uh, where there is a, a female magician, uh, her name is Bakuli Devi, and he is practicing Al Jiva Braha Mantra. Uh, this mantra is used for curing laryngitis. And there are so many practices still in still current in present Mayam. Please go to the next slide. Uh, these are some mantras which are still continuing, uh, practices of which are still current uh, in among the villagers of present Mayam. Uh, some examples only, uh, like Hapur Bhikjara Mantra. It is used to cure the pain of snake bite. Pokalor Bhikjara Mantra, it is used to cure lumbago. Uh, Pohop Bedana Mantra, it is used to cure labor pain. Sokur Kutjara Mantra, it is used to cure a type of eye disease. Osokajara Mantra, it is used to cure sprain. Zuyapura Mantra, this mantra is used to cure uh, burnt on. Uh, Zokit Bemaror Mantra, this mantra is used for uh, curing liver trouble. And there are so many mantras. I uh, would not like to uh, recite all these mantras. Please go to the next slide. Uh, uh, what is mantra now? I would speak something about the concept of mantra. A mantra is actually nothing but a combination of, of some magical words. Whether the words may have any meaning or not, it is believed that they must have some supernatural powers as they emerge for intuition, introspection, and the years-long enduring meditation. According to the basis of my own, mantra or ham is magic. In other words, magic is synonym with mantra. Mantra emerges from the original prefix mon or monon, which means thinking or meditating. According to the basis, in order to achieve desired result, the words of a mantra have to be recited or sung perfectly in a continuous play, flow in its original rhythm. The language of the mantras found in Mayong 
bears the sign of the olden forms of Assamese language. Most of the mantras in Mayang are found in the form of verses. Of course, some mantras are found in the pattern of prose also. The language of some mantras are extremely enigmatic and it is very difficult to derive any meaning of some mantras. Mystic syllables like hung, hang, ang, hot, swaha are inserted in some mantras. Please go to the next slide. So uh, these are the example of the Texas text of mantras, but uh, I would not like to recite uh, this text. I would like to request here um, to come to the skin. Sri Phonidharnath, Sri Phonidharnath, please unmute yourself and come to our skins to recite a mantra. Phonidharnath, I am going to mantra to you. I am going to ask you a mantra to I think he is in our Lakshman. Lakshman. Lakshman, please. Please unmute yourself and start your start your videos. Yes, I am starting. Yeah. Kritika, please. I have not seen him. Oh, yeah. He's coming. Namaskar. Mo nam ki phani dhau naat. Mo gaan roda mayam. Mo ay aji khud din dhuri. Tonto monto prebhaar kuri ahishu. Ya ito mano hai isumma ne ukhokar paise aru so many poor night are bitter. It is a more jiggly zano. It is a de habo beside you at a soko pute bora monto. Agonoko so Mati Puna. Siri Kishna no, seed Honontori no. Soko pute bora monto. Barabasor for you, Terabasor lie. Moi Sopukuta is a room. Sapori was a Sapori was a Sopukuta said, or Sapori was a good day. Sopukuta is a room. Sopukuta silk. Halok Uri Uri Ah, Ebaiko Louis. Mohade Parboti, Tikulot Pui Muribi, Parboti Matakabi, Edue Moi Bhutu, Monto, Upogar Puria issue, Opolu Vitor, Zishini Zanu, Tare Moi upon Monto Puti, Mukosto Ate, Isu Mukosto Nai, Tare upon Moyadi, Monto Puti, Apunanuko, Sot Dehabolu, Bisaisu. Yet Mohosto Notoka Monto A Monto Buhonote Hokolukini Ate Yarbora Moi Nozona Sumi Sai Yarbora Moi A Monto O he Dikini Neza Yake Sai Moi Moto Uriasu Buhute Yanaguai <laughs> 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 
Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, because we have not much time. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ponitor Nath, for your uh, performance. He, he actually uh, has recited the mantras, so Kutra mantra, which is used for curing dark circles uh, around the eyes. And uh, uh, at the same time, I would like to request Mr. Uh, Provin Soikia, best Provin Soikia from Oguri village of Mayong. Uh, I, I would like to welcome you to our skin uh, to recite a mantra. Provin Soikia, apuna pa mantra zonaisu. Apuni eta mantra path kori holo amar e webinar konot kahazuk korok. Provin Soikia. Provin Soikia. By upon a mantra to Nisu, unmute Corillo, I do video to start for up. Provin Suikia. I think he is not with us. Anyway, uh, I would like to uh, proceed because we have not much time. I have already crossed um, my limit. I don't know how I will uh, conclude within a few minutes. Uh, yet, please, uh, Kritika, um, uh, start my slide. I will try to conclude within a few minutes because I have already crossed my limit. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, we have uh, from previous, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. The next slide. Next slide. These are the texts of mantras and, and these are the uh, magicians of present Mayam. These are the practices. I would not like to explain one by one because uh, we have no much time. Uh, please go to the next slide. These practices are still continuing in Mayam. Uh, and next slide. Yes, these practices are also continuing, like Bet Salan Mondro, Bati Salan Mondro, uh, Bet Salan uh, Mondro, uh, Tilo Hazarika of Lon Mati Place, he is uh, uh, Ponidhornath of Rajamayam Place, and Provin Soikia of Oguri Place, uh, who are well known for their expertness in practicing the famous Muhiniban Mondro also. This Hamas mantra is also called Bokhi Koran mantra. It is used for the act of bewitching someone or to bring someone under one's control. There are four types of Muhini mantra in Mayong, still continuing. Raz Muhini, Mel Muhini, Purush Muhini, and Estri Muhini. Raz Muhini is used to bewitch a king or an officer of higher rank. Mel Muhini is used to win a trial or a quarrel. Purush Muhini is used uh, to bewitch a male person and Sri Mohini is used to bewitch a female person. Bestilo Hazurika is also famous for his uh, practice of Hapor Bihjara mantra that cures uh, the snake bite. Uh, this mantra is has also several forms like Bandhoni mantra, Bikali mantra, Gitkata mantra, Merbhaga mantra, Bejisalan mantra, Bhuirali mantra, etc. These mantras are used step by step. When one fails to remove the pain, then the next one is used. And when next one fails, and the ne uh, next one is used and such type of, uh, oh, the, the uh, process of applying all these mantras are also different from Isadar. Please uh, go to the next slide, Kritika. Please, uh, I, here I have attached two videos actually. One is uh, the uh, a view of the process of Petsalan mantra and the other is a view of the process of uh, Batisalan mantra. Uh, to, um, I think uh, the Batisalan mantra is actually used to find out uh, the magical objects 
uh, offered suspected to be buried in the compound of patient's house to harm the patients. And in case of, in this case, uh, firstly, a bati, uh, a, a bowl made of brass. Uh, it is sound uh, by the base, uttering the bati salan mantra of her it. Then the base asked a man of Ula Rakhi uh, to keep his right hand in the bati. After doing so, the bati, along with the man, starts to move here and there. The base carefully observes the movements of the bati within the premises of the victim's house. Uh, if the bati stops its movement at any point, then the base makes it sure that the buried objects, uh, I mean magical objects, are under the art of that point. Then the base, uh, then the base derives the buried objects uh, through ex ex excavation from there and inactivates the power of these sound objects by burning them or throwing them away from the premises of the victim's house. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, Kritika, please. Um, and these are also uh, different types of mantras which are still current in Mayam. Um, first one is Hat Salan photographs, and second one photographs is a view of applying Nok Basani mantra. Nok Basani mantra, uh, it is also known as Aina Basani mantra. Uh, based Hongesor Kulita is famous for his practice of Nok Basani mantra. Actually, this mantra is used, uh, it is a method of uh, divination, uh, used to find out the status of different problems and misfortunes faced by a patient or a family. Please go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Yes, no, previous slide, please, it is important. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, make a prediction about the uh, continuity of the magic practices, QSAR continuity of the magic practices. I have observed that, and it is observed carefully that the knowledge of the ways and prerequisites of applying the mantras, which are still current in Mayang, and also the text and context of the mantras have been handed down from, uh, uh, from generation to after generation, mostly in oral form. It is also observed that the edges of the, all the bases of present Mayong uh, are above 60 years, and none of them have a disciple from the new generation. As told by the old edged bases of Mayong, uh, the very new generation, even their own sons and daughters, do not like to come forward to acquire and treasure the knowledge and practices of magic which are uh, still inherent in them. The absence of new decades from new generation is drawing a question mark of the continuity of magic studies in Mayang in the coming days. Again, the most sensitive matter is that the text of the mantras along with its procedures of applications are still continuing in oral form. If this situation continues, then the possibility of finishing this body of knowledge and practices is sure to occur in the near future, mainly after the death of the old aged phases of present Mayo. Please go to the next slide. Uh, there are uh, so many actually reasons for uh, the reluctance of new generation uh, uh, to acquire the knowledge of magic practices. Uh, some among them are the spread of modern, modern education and influence of the advancement of modern science and technology, spread of modern medical and health facilities, development of transport and communication with the outside places, and influence of the culture of urbanized area, spread of new ideas, uh, new methods and new amenities of the scientific age, and mostly due to the impact of globalization, et cetera. Apart from these, there are so many other regions, uh, like majority of new generation do not like to proceed on the path of acquiring the knowledge and pra uh, practices of music as it requires a lot of hard work, patience, dedication, and meditation. Again, as this art has not become income-oriented yet, uh, they do, do, don't like or don't feel any attraction for this art as it will not help them in any way to make their future better. There are so many other reasons I have noted this, but uh, uh, considering the uh, time factor, I would like to proceed further, please. Uh, critical, go to the next slide. And um, please, uh, we all know about the necessity of safeguarding these practices. Yet I have um, speak something about this point. 
Uh, many studies, it is uh, many studies reveal that magic has a great therapeutic value from psychological viewpoint, and it can leave a good hypnotic effect in case of curing diseases. Uh, it is a, a very good way of cultivation of the inner resistant power of the patient. It gives happiness to the mind and soul, and thus enhances the willpower of the patients, which can lead them for self-healing. Magic is an inseparable part of culture and civilization and of religious and spiritual process of mankind. It offers a glimpse into some aspects of the process of socio-cultural transformation of a civilization through these centuries. Regarding the values of magic and magical practices, I have already mentioned that Barton Russell also opines it that interest in practical uses of science came first from superstitions and magic. Uh, it is one of the oldest form of people's science and research from which all the latter forms of science and research has developed. Its root could be traced back to nearly 1600 BC uh, in the industrial civilization of Indian subcontinent. Please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation uh, by speaking about the state of um, steps to be taken for safeguarding uh, this intangible heritage. Uh, I think there is the need of arrangement of awareness camp among new generation for reviving these practices as a part of their thousand years old culture. Arrangement of conference, seminar, workshop, etc., with the community people. Uh, steps to build an environment of knowledge to transfer for encouraging the new generation. The, the stakeholders' participation in the awareness camp, conference, seminar, workshop, training programs, which will help to recover and develop the skill in original form and helps in transmitting knowledge to the next generation. Inspiration to undergo intensive research work on those practices to explore its scientific value. Uh, I have uh, noted uh, so many steps uh, that are to be, that are needed to be taken for safeguarding these resources, uh, but I would not like to uh, recite this at this moment because I have already caused this limit. Please uh, uh, go to the next slide. I think this is the final slide of my presentation. Uh, next slide economic aspects. I have also uh, drawn some economic aspects of these magical practices from the viewpoint of tourism. Uh, the place Mayong is an emerging tourist, uh, emerging tourist destination in the state of Assam, the Pobitra Wildlife Sanctuary, which is famous for the world's highest density of 100 rhinoceros, is located in the heart of this place, Combi combining of hardened forests and hills, exciting wildlife, pilgrim centers, archaeological remains, vibrant culture and rustic sounds. The place Mayong is an amal amalgamation of every products of tourism. And one of the, next slide, next slide please. Uh, one of the most important uh, attraction of Mayong as a tourist destination is uh, lying in its unique tradition of music. According to the official record of Pobitra Wildlife Sanctuary during, during the tourist session, uh, 2010 and 2011, the number of Indian and foreign tourists came to visit Pobitora were uh, 13,000, but in tourist uh, in tourist season 2018, these two figures, um, I mean, in case of Indian, it is 34,000, and in case of foreign tourists, it, it becomes 605. Um, so I think um, um, uh, these practices should be revived uh, and should be uh, safeguarded uh, from the angle of tourism. There has some uh, economic aspects. Uh, please uh, I'll go to the next slide. Go to the next slide, Kritika, please. Uh, finishing, finishing slide. These are the worshiping centers. And I have to speak something about the Mayang Village Museum and Research Center also. These two photographs, PhD sign, is a part of our museum, but would not, I would not like to speak. Uh, about this uh, museum uh, because I have crossed my limit. I'm so sorry because I could not conclude. Um, uh, and at the end, at the end, please go to the next slide. Next. No. Uh, 
I have concluded my presentation with these photographs of two magicians of present Mayam. Uh, sorry for crossing the limit. And thank you so much. Namaskar. Uh, thank you, Upal sir, for enlightening us a uh, lot of uh, your extensive research uh, to bring it to us. And uh, your valuable inputs will try to uh, remember and we'll try to apply in the future. Uh, so we'll uh, not uh, waste the time and uh, we'll go to our uh, second uh, panelist. Kritika, uh, Kritika. Yes. Can, can, can you call ICICS member? member? No? Uh, yes, right there now? is a request. It is midnight in Australia. Okay, all right. Oh, uh, okay. Sir, uh, who is there from, from ICICS? Both, both Marilyn and Silly. Both her. You go to eight, eight, number eight. Serial okay, number 8.1 and serial number 8.2 okay, of okay. our program. All right. So I would uh, now request uh, Dr. Marilyn Trusco, uh, Vice President ICICH, uh, uh, to have a, uh, give a provider observation on this uh, webinar. Over to you, ma'am. Myself and also another video, but I don't think you can see me. Oh, yes, you can now. All right, well, it's almost, well, it's in half an hour, it will be more or less at midnight here in Canberra, Australia. Look, I'm not going to really comment so much, just make some more broader um, um, comments in general terms. I think probably everybody who is at this meeting comes from a community that has cultural traditions very often developed from where they live, although some people have migrated elsewhere, that have stories and practices and belief systems which responded from that environment. And I think what we're here see, being seeing in this, um, uh, this evening and Dr. Nath's very comprehensive uh, um, description and so on is one group. So just really quickly and very quickly about myself, I suppose, because yes, I'm an Australian. I was born in another country to Australian parents. As a child, I lived both in Canberra, the capital of Australia, but also in other countries, went to school in other languages. And as an adult, having studied archeology, span I've come quickly back to that. I did my masters in another part of the world in the Middle East, but I lived in different continents, as I said, in different languages. And, and yes, as a tourist, of course, very briefly visited other sorts of communities and saw their culture. Uh, gives us a sense of place, our own, gives us a perspective on our own, but also on others. Um, so just really quickly, um, I think, uh, and also as an archeologist, you know, archeology span is not about digging, it's about finding out from material information past and present cultures. The past is the nanosecond ago. And in doing that work, one is always with the local community as well, getting a strong sense of their place, their beliefs, their practices. Um, so we've talked of globalization in the scientific area, but I guess it was what I was trying to say just then, is it's a continuity there and, and carrying with you um, that past, including in Europe, I lived in Germany for some time, and the local village, all the stories and, and practices and the, the, the dragon that killed the, 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 I can't remember that particular one, or the mermaids that swam in the River Rhine and so on. Those sorts of things, uh, if not believed, are, are, are treasured as part of past responses to the environment. And don't forget that today's medicines came out of those foods that understanding of the environment, what made people really sick, but maybe eating something else um, made them feel better. And those fruits and vegetables and other things have been scientifically examined and now turned into medicine. So there is, as I said, that continuity. Um, I've, I've flagged that I've been in many different parts of the world in different continents. I'll now perhaps very quickly um, mention um, as another example, but there are in many parts of the world that you would be aware of, the big continent of Australia. It looks smaller in the maps, but we are not the biggest continent, but we are a continent. 
and some 60, 65,000 years ago, and we all came out of Africa originally, um, came eventually to Australia via Indonesia and so on, but even coming into the continent, and it was bigger then, it included New Guinea and, and Tasmania, because we're talking uh, before the end of the Ice Age, which was 10,000 years ago only, um, came across that part of sea, and there are some at the time of colonization, a bit over 200 years ago, um, there were 250 language groups, and we have very different environments, of course, across the continent, with some 800 different dialects as part of that. Um, and their roles, their community, their understanding, their, their responsibilities within the community, um, their trade across the, with other groups and so on, are uh, um, probably typical but different in their own particular way. Australia is quite a unique continent in terms of its animals and plants being so separate for millennia, long before people even existed in the world. Um, so from that point of view, it's quite interesting for people who visit and of course the current population. The Indigenous people of Australia form some 3.3%. Being a very uh, arid land, it wasn't a huge numbers of people, but, but still, as I said, many different language groups and so on. Australians themselves are very, um, other Australians are very, very diverse hugely different language groups, different continents people have come from. And you may know that at the moment, lots of Indians are coming to Australia. The second largest migrant group along with Chinese coming to your Chinese part of the world really difficult. But just back to the indigenous people, there was always somebody in the community that um, and they had different roles. Some of the women had particular um, uh, uh, spiritual roles, some of the men, there wasn't necessarily a chief always, there was, but there was a group that made decisions. And there was what in English is called a witch doctor who dealt with health and um, certain um, special uh, procedures and songs and dances and so on for people's health, which has got maybe some uh, similarities to the example we've just seen. Um, but uh, as I said, called the witch doctors. Um, responsibility for health, but also, as I said, um, and, and that varied according to the place and the environment. And I think I don't want to be putting down what we've just seen. What I'm trying to say is that that, that uniqueness exists in other forms of expression and are unique in other parts of the world. And we all carry that as part of ours. I'm, um, my parents are of Celtic, uh, descent, my mother was actually born in Ireland, um, and those stories and those beliefs of that environment have been brought to Australia as well, and we know that in other places. So I guess really I've probably talked too long and missed out on some of the things I was going to say, but I, 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 I guess I'm trying to also put this wonderful example and, and unique in your country um, within its diversity, I've been to your country, but not everywhere, but I know it's very diverse across its spaces. Um, this one example, when we know there are many others as well, and that we want to treasure them, and that change with continuity is the most important thing. Change with continuity, and I think I've flagged the, the fact that that is happening and has been happening for thousands of years as people have landed, arrived in a place, as the first peoples in that area out of Africa or in Africa, and then continued on, the climate has changed, um, their understanding, their trade has changed and so on, but they've carried the origins, the stories and beliefs with them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, now I uh, request uh, Dr. Shelley and uh, Alec, General Secretary, ICACH. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, um, and thank you for inviting me um, to respond or to uh, present some of my observ observations here. Um, I must say that I've been, that I was very much impressed listening to the presentation and um, uh, looking into the issues that were presented here. And I found this to be 
um, enlightening and very different to many of the issues that I deal with here in Israel. So I'm from Israel. Um, and although um, we belong to the um, uh, Asian continent, um, we have in Israel um, many similar issues to those in Europe. So let me just tell you a couple of um, things that we're doing on the Bureau, the ICICH Bureau at the moment. What we've been trying to do over the last year is to bring together colleagues from different regions on the scientific, um, on the scientific uh, committee. And we've been holding regional meetings. I think that this, is, this meeting, this webinar today is one of, is, is such an example. We've been trying to bring together people from the European Scientific Committee together, as we feel that we've had, we ha do have very common issues. And I'm sure that you, you might be aware of the fact that in, Euro in the European um, region, we deal mostly with tangible heritage, or well, that's been the case up till now. So looking into this presentation, um, which I just heard, and have been very interested in. I see that we have so much to learn from you. We're used to dealing with tangible heritage, with built heritage, with monuments, and much less used to actually discussing the traditions, the, um, um, the, different, um, uh, the different aspects, different other di different aspects of uh, intangible heritage. So, from here, from you, the European um, view, we look at you and learn from you and try to perhaps understand how we can do much of what you people are doing in the same way. Um, so thank you for this very clear presentation and for clarifying um, this interesting uh, issue. Um, my question always is, how to preserve intangible heritage without actually imposing ourselves as professionals onto the community. I find this extremely interesting, <coughs> excuse me. I find this extremely important because often professionals come over, think they know how to manage the community and how to manage their intangible heritage and basically, we often forget that the intangible heritage belongs to the community and it reflects the community, its spiritual identity and its um, 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 memories. And I feel that this is the main question when we talk about safeguarding intangible heritage. Um, and uh, towards the end of the presentation, you discuss tourism. Um, I must say that although I know that often tourism is a economic factor for safeguarding intangible heritage, but I must say that I myself am more worried about tourism overtaking intangible heritage and changing intangible heritage into something different. I much prefer the idea of a local museum and um, how, how we can actually, and working with the community to assist the community in going through this procedure of evaluating um, the intangible heritage and the community looking for their own means to safeguard what's important for them and for the community themselves looking into um, these specific and, and ways of managing safe, if, managing tangible heritage, intangible heritage is at all possible. I am aware that, um, as you have said many times, that we're losing, as the every day that goes by, we're losing more and more intangible heritage. Um, and the community, um, although we would like them to continue developing into the 21st century, and into modern times, I think the key factor is the community. So I congratulate you on uh, the work you're doing um, on this very interesting issue on the magic that you've showed us. And as I say, I think here, definitely in Israel, 
And I think the entire European um, committee has a lot to learn for, from you. So thank you very much for sharing this with, with us. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for sharing your knowledge to us. Now we will uh, uh, move on to our uh, second uh, guest panelist, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Dilip Kumar Kalita, uh, pardon. He's our director, uh, Anandaram Borua Institute of Language, Art and Culture, Guwahati. He has received his PhD under the guidance of Professor Birandana Dotta on magical uh, beliefs and practices in Assam with special reference to the magic lore of Mayam from Guwahati University, Assam. He's a member uh, of University International Society for Folk uh, Narrative Research, Folklore Society of Assam, Language and Information Technology De Development 20, Bureau of Indian Standards, Government of India, Joint Secretary of Assam Academy of Cultural Relations, et cetera, and recipient of Assam Sahitya Sava Award. He has done extensive work on various research paper uh, in many national and international conferences, workshops on different issues on folklore of Northeast India. He has also initiated uh, three documentaries related to social cultural aspects of Assam, pardon, for Durdashan and All India Radio. Welcome, Dilip, sir. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Kritika. Very warm greetings from my side to all the participants. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, you can upload my, uh, share my PT uh, also. First slide, okay. <coughs> so um, I'll be talking on tiger lore and magic of my own and try to refrain from uh, repeating what Dr. Utpal Nath has said. Um, but I would like to give a small introduction of the whole uh, gamut of magic and magic studies in Assam and elsewhere. Well, uh, the importance of the study of magic uh, uh, took momentum with the uh, collection of uh, the Golden Bow by Fraser in the West. It was in 1922. Then again in 1937, uh, Evans Pritchard published his uh, witchcraft uh, oracles and magic among the Azande. Then again, in 1974, there was a um, encyclopedia, which was published from London, New York, Toronto, and Sydney, which was edited by Venetia Nawal. And the for, uh, preface was written by Professor Richard Dorson, and he is a folklorist. Incidentally, I also am a folklorist. Uh, so I like the approaches that he mentioned in the preface for the study of magic. Now, this is the Western uh, uh, way of looking at magic by uh, different scholars. But before that, magic had been occupying a very important role in the Indian culture, uh, literature, or Indian knowledge system. Uh, uh, from the times of the Vedas, the fourth Veda, the Atharva Veda, is uh, a collection of magical formulas. And uh, there are remedies. Now, what, what we call magic is the control of uh, nature by human beings. And in Atharva Veda, the same thing has been uh, done, not merely in Atharva Veda, in Rig Veda and Samveda and Yajur Veda also, there are some portions where uh, the attempt to control the forces of nature has been made through magic. Now, uh, Atharva Veda uh, specializes in it. Now, in the Atharva Veda, uh, it not only has been trying to, uh, had tried to control the forces of nature, but it was also a study, a, a scientific study of its own nature. Now, nowadays, uh, magic has been studied in different ways. Uh, um, it is classified into homeopathic magic, sympathetic magic, black magic, white magic, etc., etc. In the Atharva Veda, 
it did not classify in that manner. Uh, it classified as uh, Ayusha, then Amanasha, Bhesacha, etc. Well, I have uh, kept a record of it, how it was. Yeah. Then Avicharika, Stri Karman, Postika, Raja Karman, Prayaschita. Prayaschita. These were the four types of magic that were identified in the Atharva Veda. Now, these types may not be similar to the types that are um, made by the modern uh, scholars, mostly anthropologists. Magic has always been a field for the uh, field of study for the anthropologist, but then uh, folklorists have, have also crept into this field because at one time uh, people regarded folklore to be a part of anthropology, which uh, finally grew up to be a, a, an independent discipline. And now in folklore also magic is studied in the same way as it is, it is studied in anthropology, but with a different point of view. In uh, the uh, in preface to the encyclopedia of the uh, witchcraft and magic uh, edited by Venetia Neval, Richard Dawson had said that there are four ways to study magic. One is historical, one is anthropological, uh, one is folkloric, and the other is the polemical. Now, common people are always concerned with this polemical aspect. Whether it is true or false, whether it is right or wrong, whether it can be possible or not, whether it is really done or not, these type of concerns are <coughs> the concerns of the common people regarding magic. magic. Now, uh, in this slide, uh, there are certain uh, beliefs about Mayong. The people of Mayong are masters of the art of magic. People of uh, Mayong know mantras. People of Mayong keep Bira and Daini and other spirits. They regularly offer puja to these spirits. Now I'll talk about this Bira and Daini. Now, uh, people believe that these are uh, some beings, some spirits, which can be tamed by the magician and can be used for his benefit. Um, this belief is not prevalent among the people of Mayong alone. It is prevalent across religions and across, across uh, localities. It is prevalent everywhere. And uh, in uh, one case, a very uh, important person whom we call VIP also claimed that he, he was rearing Bira for his political career. So these type of claims are made uh, from time to time. Uh, now, in case of Daini, Daini is a concept where it is believed that a person uh, himself or herself converts into a spirit or a spiritual being and can do harm, mostly harm. The Daini is never uh, considered to be benign. It is always harmful. So. The, uh, one can become a daini and harm others. And these beliefs are very strong, uh, not only in Mayong, but throughout Assam. Now I'm talking about the whole um, purview of Assam, because um, I did my PhD on the magical beliefs and practices of Assam. And at that time, I had made some uh, study in different places and in different communities. And I have found that there are some similarities with Mayong and other places also. So in case of this Daini, among some communities, it is so prominent and it is so deeply rooted that people believe that a person is a potential uh, evil, a person mostly uh, aged ladies and old, old men used to be targeted to be Dainis and they used to be lynched. Until recently, lots of lynchings have taken place. And uh, people, one of the victims who escaped lynching, uh, raised a war against this system. And finally, she had been, uh, her name had been nominated for the uh, Nobel Prize also. Her name is Biru Balarabha, Nobel Prize for Peace. But I, uh, uh, anyway, so this practice is there throughout Assam and particularly among the tribal communities. 
uh, in non non tribal communities also it is prevalent but then uh, these beliefs are also magical beliefs which we share throughout assam as well as in maya when i did my field work in maya i found similar beliefs there people also believe that one can turn into uh, a spirit or a spirit can turn into a human being and live with human beings so these type of stories are there a lot of stories are prevalent then there is the uh, story of the were tiger where a <clears throat> human being transforms himself into a tiger there are elaborate rituals for conversion into a tiger um, a piece of plantain leaf is um, marked with charcoal to give it the look like the um, fur of the royal bengal tiger and then that plantain leaf is attached to the person and then he turns into a tiger this is the belief now this belief is there in maya and the same belief is prevalent in uh, different places of assam among different communities among the karbi community for example we have a belief similar to this where a person uh, uh, simply goes to a particular stone particular rock and rubs his body against the rock and then becomes a tiger so this type of beliefs are there then uh, now i'm uh, talking about all these things because i am going to lay more emphasis on the tiger lore of maya that is why i am talking about all this but before that i would like to mention about the principles of the folk medicine um, actually magic is almost synonymous with folk medicine in folk medicine we have two components one is the magical component and the other is the empirical component now in every place even in mayong we have a very strong practice of folk medicine a very strong practice of empirical medicine or herbal medicine now a lot has to be done about the herbal medicine uh, there are uh, different uh, remedies for different uh, diseases different ailments which are given by the practitioners of magic who are popularly called baj now uh, along with their utterance of the mantras or utterance of the spells and charms they apply the empirical medicine also and uh, in my experience i have seen that they are very very effective in one case i had seen that uh, in case of a fractured bone also the empirical medicine was very very effective Uh, a person whose bone uh, a bone fracture was repaired with defect in a medical college went to the base of the mayo base of mayo and the base simply broke the bone and repaired it uh, with his herbal medicine he tied his herbs around his hands and finally it was cured his hand became straight so this was a personal experience that i i share i had seen it while doing my uh, field work some 37 years ago so there are some uh, very very strong cases for the empirical medicine the herbal medicine that has been practiced in mayong and the the chemical properties and the medic medicinal properties of these herbal medicines has to be found out and the medicinal plants have also to be identified now it's a very uh, great problem that all the Uh, plants have not been identified till now the taxonomy doesn't cover all the plants that the base uses there are more uncovered plants than uh, discovered plants i don't know i may be wrong i am a student of arts uh, with a uh, uh, say uh, folkloristic um, and art uh, scientific bent of mind uh, i find that there are lots of herbs and plants which are yet to be uh, examined for their medicinal or chemical properties uh, in some cases in some uh, in case of some plants it has been seen that the names of the plants differ in the textbook of botany you find a plant by one name and the base knows it by another name 
So at times it becomes very difficult to identify about which plant is the best talking and which is the plant that has been identified in the botany text. So this kind of work has to be carried out. If we carried out, carry out some extensive work uh, in the field of ethnobotany, then I think uh, a lot of uh, valuable input will come from the uh, empirical uh, experience of the badges in case of folk medicine. Now, these badges have their own um, scientific thinking. I call it scientific thinking because in case of medical science, what we do, we first diagnose the cause. There is the diagnostics. After diagnosing, the remedy is offered. So they also think in the same way. Only the thing is that theirs is not two plus two is equal to four. Theirs is not as scientific as the modern medical science, but theirs is based on belief. Now, in their belief, uh, they diagnose diseases uh, through their own ways and they have their own causation of disease. Now, in case of modern medical science, we have the causation of disease attributed to germs, virus, fungus, bacteria, etc. But in case of this uh, folk medicine men throughout the world, they have their own uh, causation of disease, which may include medical causes, then um, human beings also may become a cause of disease, animals may become a cause of disease, a uh, particular uh, black magic by somebody may become a cause of magic, uh, cause of disease. So in this way, they have their own causation of disease and uh, for uh, different co uh, causation of disease, the remedies are also uh, given in the same way, different types of remedies are given. Uh, I think uh, we can go to the uh, next slide. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is a gentleman, Benudhar Rajkua, who had uh, written a book which was published in 1973, but it, it was written quite early quite earlier to that. And uh, he had, he was uh, actually the first person to record these kind of things about uh, Mayo in a book. His, the name of his book was, uh, um, Magic and, uh, well, it was Supernatural or something. I, I Just now I can't remember the name anyway. Uh, well, I'll just, I'll just provide the name because it is quite important. Uh, this is the first book that was, that has recorded Mayong as a place of magic. Well. Assamese popular superstitions and Assamese demonology. This was the name of the book, which was published in 1973, and it was published by Gohati University. And in that book, he has mentioned all these things. The half burned wooden pegs on which cooking pot is rested take root, then a man seat sticks to him, a tree stands, although it is cut, a cooked pigeon when it eaten becomes live in the stomach, when man eats rice, and milk, this never, this is never digested, but takes root. A rib of a plantain leaf is turned into a snake. The leaf of a sora tree are turned into poliha or cow fishes. These are, this is the climbing fish. So we can go to the next slide. So these are the beliefs that people have. Um, please go to the next slide after this. So these are, these are the kind of belief. Uh, our earlier speaker, Paul, also has uh, mentioned about a lot of beliefs about Mayang, and people still have such beliefs. Now, um, there is a very thin line of difference between superstition and belief. For some, it is superstition, but for some, his or her belief is true. They believe it to be true. Even if it is superstition, he or she believes it to be 
true and if he or she believes it to be true then it is truth for him it is just like the sun and the moon and the truth so the people not only of my own throughout the world have such beliefs for which people regard the number 13 as unlucky in some countries four is unlucky instead of the story four fourth story uh, you'll have f for example first second third and then you have f story then fifth story no fourth story so these kind of beliefs are there throughout the world and people believe in them however much educated we are however much scientific we are yet we have this kind of beliefs at the deep uh, depth of our hearts i think we have carried it in our genes from our primitive ancestors anyway because of that people depend on this magic the people get cured from this magic get cured with this magic people use this magic and have benefit in case of diseases uh, it has been said that uh, 50% of the uh, remedy is generated by the a patient himself through his immune system and the rest is assisted by the medicines and the doctor so these are sayings so in the same way i think the people who believe in this folk medicine have great faith on the folk medicine man for which he or she gets a great benefit from the folk medicine apart from the strength of the empirical medicine the belief itself is very powerful at times it is uh, i have some personal experiences during my field work i had uh, gone through uh, certain um, phases uh, where i had examined and cross examined and i had found that in case of a doctor who was a uh, mbbs doctor uh, he used to cure patients he used to um, uh, prescribe medicine to patients and uh, um, after a week or so the patient used to ask him would you mind if i show my disease to your father that means the doctor's father happened to be a bass the doctor used to say oh i don't mind you can easily you can go he is he is home so the patient used to go to the father of the doctor and uh, the father of the doctor used to do some kind of charming and after Uh, a day or two the patient was cured now whether the patient was cured by the seven days course of the uh, mbbs doctor or uh, one or two days um, uh, charming of the father of the doctor it's not known but yet it is the belief and people did not get cured unless it was the best mbbs or uh, allopathic doctors could not cure patients they always had complaints those people particularly who have complaints now there are certain cases where people definitely resort to the um, base the uh, magical performer the medicine village medicine man who is almost synonymous with the base in case of snake bite in case of uh, uh, say dog bite or bite from the cat or other animals uh, then there are certain diseases where people have more belief on the village medicine man in case of jaundice also people have in uh, the whole of assam people have more belief on the village, village medicine man they don't resort to the they don't resort to the modern medicine uh, they don't visit the um, uh, allopathic doctor but they visit the village medicine man he gives some medicine sometimes his cure is just Uh, uh putting a garland on the top of the head and sending the patient away gradually the garland grows bigger and finally it comes down to the neck and finally it uh, comes down to his shoulders and finally it goes down through his legs the um, garland grows bigger and bigger and when the garland uh, passes through the body and reaches the body uh, reaches his legs then the jaundice is cured this is the belief now this has never been uh, examined what is the uh, level of bilirubin at the beginning or what is the level of the bilirubin at the end these are never examined but these are beliefs and they observe certain dietary regulations now these village medicine men give some dietary regulations which the patients follow 
if the doctor, the allopathic doctor, the medical college professor says don't eat this, the patients may not listen to him. But if the village medicine man says, then he will definitely listen because it is uh, embedded in the um, belief system of the person. So in this way, uh, these beliefs are very strong rooted. And uh, in case of Mayong, I wonder why uh, Mayong was uh, spotted out when we have magical beliefs and practices throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the whole of Assam. Yet Mayong was spotted out, Mayong was named, and uh, Mayong had the, uh, call it notoriety or call it um, <laughs> uh, famous, whatever you may, but it was tagged with Mayong. Magical beliefs and practices were tagged with Mayong. Even in the history books, uh, we have references where um, the soldiers were turned into lambs in the country where the uh, uh, the all woman kingdom was present and that the place of that all woman kingdom was Kondoli and Kondoli is an adjacent area of Maya. It is just within Maya. Uh, so uh, within the cultural boundary of Maya, I would say. So in this way, Maya was uh, spotted out to be the place uh, famous for magic and it gained its name and people, whether true or false, they claim that they have learned magic in Mayong and they have started practicing. So this type of practice is there. And whenever there is a, now in case of magic, there is a uh, system of uh, cursing and uh, uttering oath. If this does not happen, then you will eat the head of so-and-so. If this does not happen, then uh, my head will fall down. So these type of things are uttered. Now here, when the bells, the practitioner bells everywhere in Assam, utters a mantra, then he talks of Mayong, the guru of Mayong, the uh, say the, uh, the temple of Kamakha. Now Kamakha is very famous. Uh, as a tantric uh, pita, it is uh, the yoni pita of uh, the Devi. <coughs> so Kamaika's name is also associated with tantrism, and the basis they utter the name of Kamaika and Mayong invariably in order to make their charms efficacious. And people also feel that this base has learned his magic from Mayong, therefore he is a very um, adept. Uh, bells, so I will be cured. This type of belief is there. Now, uh, oh yeah, we have come down to snake bite. Now we, we have to go back. We have to go back to tiger lore. I was talking a lot on something. Okay, now let's talk about this tiger lore. Actually here, hunting tiger with the help of magic was a common practice in the olden times. Now it is Tiger hunting or any type of hunting is hunting is prohibited. It cannot be hunted anymore. But at one time, there used to be a lot of hunting. There used to be a lot of um, um, captivating elephants, hunting tigers, deers, boars. These, these were very common. During the British period, it was all the more. And uh, after the uh, going away of the British, it continued for some time and gradually professor, lovers they have uh, professor yeah uh, time is going to end okay time, time is going to end it is about to seven okay 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 oh i'm so sorry i have taken already 20, 25 plus minutes so um, so here in this um, hunting was done with the help of magic there was a great belief on magic so since there is um, uh, paucity of time, I will not explain everything, but there used to be a bez, there used to be a king, and there used to be the public, and the public depended upon the bez, and the order was finally given by the king at the behest of the uh, bez, and then only the tiger was um, captivated and held captive. It was then killed. Normally, it was killed. So uh, this, there was an elaborate system. I will not explain it. So please 
to the next slide if it is any, anything is important yeah so in case of snake bite actually people believe that uh, uh, doctors cannot cure snake bite this is the uh, co common belief the bears can cure snake bite so whenever there is a case of snake bite people run to the bears and when the um, um, when somebody runs to the bears the person who is who has been bitten by snake he begins his waiting for the bears to come or the remedy to come so in this process he crosses 30 minutes of the um, uh, crucial time which is um, very dangerous for heart attack he crosses that and he um, is safe from heart attack he has no heart attack but if it is bitten by a poisonous snake and sufficient venom has been invested in uh, um, injected then uh, there are chances that the person dies and when such person dies even after the coming of the bears or informing the bears then it is believed that it is not the snake but it is kal it is the destiny that has bitten him so people accept it that way and in case of the cure of the bears there are some peculiar kind of cures i had seen in one case that the person who went to uh, give the information to the bears was given a uh, slap on the face and that slap on the face was itself the treatment the man came running to the patient again and the patient was cured and it was said that the stronger the slap the uh, more effective the cure then there are uh, dharani dhara, dharani dhara mantra that is the uh, say uh, first aid some knots are tied around the parts where uh, just above the part where snake has bitten then the poison is uh, brought out by sucking the poison then by using charmed water then by using charmed stone also in this way uh, snake bite is cured please to the next um, next slide is there anything well uh, in case of mantra literatures now the basis believe that um, the mantras that they know in my case, it was so actually, it was my personal experience. The Bezos believe that the mantras they use are secret and nobody knows except him. That was their belief or his uh, fellow um, brothers who learned from the same guru. But when I went to the field, I took some printed books which were published from different places. Uh, it was published from Dibrugar, from Jorhat, from Gohati. So in this way, uh, I bought all the small mantra books which were available in the market and I went there. And then uh, when I uh, sat with the bears, I was an uh, evidence to the curing of the curing by the bears. Then the mantras he uttered and when I wanted to note it down, he didn't allow me to note it down. He said it is secret. But then when I uh, recited the mantra from the printed book, is it the same mantra? He said, oh, how do you know it? So this kind of belief is there. Some people even don't know that the mantra books are already in the print. It has already been published. But the belief is that this bez is more powerful because he knows uh, this mantra, which no other bez knows. So these kind of beliefs are there. So in this way, uh, people have great faith on this uh, magic in Mayong in other places also i don't say that it is not prevalent in other places uh, paul has said uh, a lot about the mantras uh, please in the next slide is there is anything what is there in the next slide remedies okay please no, go to the next yeah well now the uh, mantras of other uh, mayong and the bases it is believed that it continues from the Atharva Veda. And there is a uh, verse in the mantra, mantra books itself where it is said, Ananta Bukhai Kutya Asante Sari Veda Bajo Bhoila Nisaho Karante Unkare Kobode Atharva Ved Bhoila Atharva Vedora Ido Koroti Kohe Koroti Mantra Jogatatrohe. So this is about the Koroti Mantra, which says that. Um, when the uh, when Lord Vishnu was uh, sleeping, then the Vedas came out and uh, 
it was the atharva veda from where the koroti mantras came out and koroti mantras are abundant or prevalent in this world so th this this way in this way they relate the um, heritage of the mantras to the atharva veda and some of the mantras it is true that some of the mantras are same as uh, those from the atharva veda some of the mantras are same and some are translated some of the atharva veda mantras are translated and some of the translations have come from different languages we, I have come across even Uriya mantras in Mayong and Bengali mantras in Mayong. The bases they use everything. They think that uh, the um, these um, mantras, these um, charms from different communities or different languages are more efficacious. So these type of beliefs are there. And in the causation of disease, it is always believed that uh, every community, every living being, every um, animal or every plant is a potential cause of disease. So in this way, uh, their remedy is also created in this manner and the herbal medicine as well as the medical medicine is used ex extensively. And uh, because of the uh, deep rooted belief of the people, though the situation has improved now uh, regarding the medical health, uh, the health care system, yet the Magical beliefs and practices are still prevalent in my own. And I believe that this will continue uh, till um, uh, quite long time and uh, it will always be there. So with this, I conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir, for your valuable information regarding Mayan and their traditional knowledge regarding the medicinal herbs. Uh, so if we are uh, running out of time, so I would uh, request uh, the guest observers uh, to kindly restrict their uh, time limit uh, to uh, one or two minutes. So today we have uh, our guest uh, observers with us. I would request uh, Professor Manindranath Thakur, Center for Political Studies, JNU, New Delhi, to provide observations on the webinar. Welcome, sir. Kritika, can you identify his login? Yes, I'll just check. Uh, no, he is not there, ma'am. So we'll uh, move on to our next uh, guest obje observer. I would uh, request uh, Professor Ravindranath Sharma, Center for Tribal Studies, Jharkhand University. Ravinder, sir. Sir, you are on mute. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. are you audible? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you and good evening to Indian participants and good uh, Yes, it is up to the country concerned. And I'm happy to listen to uh, a presentation of two experts. One is young expert and another one is senior expert, doc, uh, Dr. Utpal Nath and Professor Dilip Kumar Kolita. And this is very interesting uh, topic organized by I, uh, ICOMS India Northeast Zone and ICICH and uh, NSCICH ICOMS India. Uh, because this is a very relevant and even in this pandemic situation, if we see the uh, situation globally, then uh, people are uh, more concerned about the oral tradition and this tradition uh, which is observed in uh, particularly uh, Northeast India, in particularly in Assam, which the Professor Dilip Kolitasar say, mentioned in his presentation and Utpal Nath uh, presented in his uh, presentation, particularly in Mayong area, from their own experience. 
and now it is very concerned to all of us that how can we preserve this tradition this is basically a oral tradition and somehow uh, peoples of this region partic uh, particularly uh, uh, peoples of northeast india is still keeping this heritage alive so uh, now uh, uh, for us as this is a old heritage and now it is a time uh, to all of us to how to preserve this tradition in this context as i'm a uh, uh, i'm from the uh, academic background and this is also our duty so uh, can we do something uh, in this regard because uh, in our university we have school for the culture in other most of the universities generally uh, universities is having uh, school of humanities and social science or commerce school of commerce etc but our university uh, is having school for the study of culture where we are dealing with the uh, culture traditions of various communities of uh, uh, jharkhand and uh, uh, in particular communities of india uh, and abroad in general so we have department of tribal studies where uh, people uh, students are studying folklore and anthropology and we have uh, department of customary law we have department of music uh, uh, music and theater and uh, we have center for endangered languages so we um, all our departments uh, under the school of culture we are looking uh, dealing all these things how can uh, and this is our concern also how can we preserve the tradition and now it is a high time how can we uh, make it alive and we keep this tradition uh, to make our heritage strong because this uh, the mayong is a very historically famous place uh, for and it is famous for uh, this uh, traditional practices uh, and Again, if we see uh, presently, uh, this uh, government of India is also initiated this Ayush ministry where they have given emphasis on, uh, 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 they have given more emphasis on the alternative medicine also. So what I understood from this previous two presentations that we can keep this practice as a part of alternative medicine and if the uh, uh, organizations like UNESCO and other organizations comes forward and uh, make it a heritage site, then it will be very fruitful and that will be a great contribution to all of us. And uh, this, uh, I have uh, uh, makes uh, some observation that as this uh, place is famous for, uh, and most of the medicine men use herbals and which is locally available and again this uh, mayong area is very close with the uh, capital city guwahati so uh, the some organization may make uh, some plan to make herbal medicinal garden and the local uh, practitioners uh, they can make uh, this uh, they, 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 yes they, they can be a uh, caretaker or uh, this organization can make them uh, some uh, uh, responsibilities also uh, to make the herbal, uh, herbal, uh, herbal garden and uh, again this uh, i have observed in uh, dr uh, utpal's presentation he has mentioned he has shown a few pictures on mayong, mayong village museum and research center so from that center, uh, they can make uh, some plan how to make it popular. And again, how to make this place as a tourist destination. Of course, it is a tourist destined place, but still this uh, museum can make uh, some effort to make the living museum and uh, again the local uh, institutions research institutions local colleges uh, universities can take up some uh, programs and of course we are fortunate that we have professor dilip kumar kolita among us 
uh, who is the director of Anandaram Bura Institute of Language, Art and Culture. This and uh, this uh, Abilak is having tie up with uh, universities like Guwahati University and Dibrugar University. So in this context, these uh, uh, institutes like Abilak uh, can make some short term programs uh, to, to the uh, academic st students or scholars. So these are my few observations, and I hope uh, uh, this uh, webinar will make, and this webinar will give a, a part to make the Mayong as a heritage site. And I hope uh, this kind of program will organize again, and we'll get, uh, we are hopeful for that. So. Uh, with these few words, i like to conclude uh, in this point itself. Thank you. Over to Kritika. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Daisy Hazarika, Department of Anthropology, Oregon University, USA. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Can you see me? Hi. Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. So. Just for clarification, I'm not yet Dr. Daisy Hazarika. I'm still doing my PhD. I'm a PhD candidate here. So just, I'm Daisy Hazarika as of now. Hopefully I'll be doctor someday. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Utpal Nath, Dr. Dilip Kumar Kalita, um, and ICICIH, ICOMOS India for organizing such a wonderful webinar. Um, the presentations were like really great and uh, I, being from Assam, um, got to know a lot about Mayong. And I haven't done a lot of work on Mayong, but the research that I'm doing right now for my PhD thesis kind of relates to the magic and sorcery in Mayong. So I do my research on um, like witchcraft accusations against indigenous women in Assam who are claimed to have their like crafts um, who who claim that they like, who, like not, not they like they, they they don't claim like the people claim that you know, uh, the women who are being accused as witches they have learned their skills from the sorcerers in Maya. So what, like keep keeping us apart. So what I got to know about um, what I observed about the presentation today is that you know, people are getting aware of uh, you know how important the the alternate epistemologists are you know the, the alternate kind of medicines are so we have we as like modern human beings are so much um engrossed with the western forms of knowledge uh, especially after colonization that we have forgotten that there are other kinds of knowledge systems in uh like that that are pre prevalent among the indigenous in that are pre prevalent among the indigenous communities, and they are as um, they are as important as um, modern science, and to some and sometimes even more because uh, some of these epistemologies or knowledge systems can um, give us breakthrough, um, like breakthrough ways of um, tack tackling some things that. Um, modern science have not been able to do. So without discounting the importance of these kind of um, knowledge systems of epistemologies, um, it, is, it's, it is essential that, you know, we um, try to um, conserve these, these kind of, um, these, these kind of knowledge systems. Um, so, um, I am very impressed and, and, and I'm very pleased to know that Dr. Utpal Nath, his team and Dr. and ICOMOS India and other, um, and ICACIH are trying their best to preserve this kind of, um, this kind of like um, knowledge systems. And hopefully in the near future, you know, we will see more of these kind of webinars where we can like um, hear we can we can learn more about um, the tangible and intangible heritages of Assam and other um, 
cultures of India as well as the um, other indigenous communities in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deji, ma'am. Uh, now we will, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Shopmanil Borwa, former IS, Guwahati, Assam. Over to you, sir. Shopmanil, sir. Uh, very good evening, morning, wherever it is. Thank you very much. Uh, as you have introduced me, I'm a civil servant, not an academic nor a historian. Uh, I've been working in this Mayong area for the last two or three years, Katsu Polnat. We are a part of the, the Intac Assam chapter, which is redoing the museum, or rather have redone the museum as it was in, in virtual shambles, and we've managed to put in a lot of uh, the artifacts that was available in the museum that had started about 10 years ago, remained incomplete, unattended, uncared for. And we were helped, uh, Dr. Sheila Bora and me, both of us took the lead in getting the museum in place, recovering the artifacts, and also most importantly, looking for the, the manuscripts uh, on the black magic, white magic, whatever you call it, and treating those manuscripts and the digitizing them. That is what we have done so far. About this Mayong area, it seems to be a principality at the edge of the territory of the Ahom Borpukon. The Ahom Borpukon's area entered in a, ended in a place called Kajali Soki, uh, which is about uh, nearly 10 kilometers from the deputy commissioner's courts. Uh, in Kasari Ghat, along the river, Brahmaputra upstream. Uh, this area was primarily inhabited by the Nath Jogi people. And there was some kind of a principality there, which is evident from the uh, pieced up uh, rock inscription, which is there in Buramaya. Initially, there were head hunting, I mean, head uh, human sacrificing societies, uh, but subsequently, uh, they came under the influence of uh, Srimanta Shankardev and a lot of Vaishnavite influence came in. These Najogi people are no, originally from Uttar Pradesh, in a place called Gorakhpur. They are followers of uh, Goraknath, Machendranath, and Dhanantari. And uh, they had this tradition of combining alchemy and mysticism as a part of their daily rituals. So we find this treatment and also we find <clears throat> a little bit of white black magic combined to treat people. So there was a psychological approach and also a physical approach to treatment of these people. And now the Siddhi tradition is a very strong tradition in India. As you all know, it extends throughout the country. The Nath Jogis are there. Aditya Nath, Jogi Aditya Nath heads the Gorakhpur Mutt, which is one of the principal centers. Yogi Adityanath also happens to be the chief minister of the biggest province in India, that is Uttar Pradesh. Now these Nath Yogis came and started uh, their practices of treatment, which uh, brings into another question is the migration route of the Nath Yogis. We find them in Gualpara, we find them in uh, a bit in Kamrup in the Nalbari area, then we find further up the, towards the east, we find a concentration in Mayong area, and just opposite Mayong area across the river, we have uh, this area called the Sipajhar area, which is again virtually the headquarters of the Nath Jogi people. Most of the, I think the single largest concentration of the Nath Jogi people would be in the Sipajhar area of the Darang district, which is just across the river, the river Brahmaputra, as I'm talking about now. Now, we have to really see whether the people of Mayang are from that batch of people or which migrated from Golpara to Nalbari to Darang and then came and settled in Mayang or uh, whether it's there something apart. The isolation, geographic isolation of that area definitely helped in the mystic, 
you know, the aura that uh, went around the place because we have bases all throughout the state as uh, Dr. Dilip Kulita had mentioned. And this uh, concept of the bears uh, uh, is already, as he has mentioned, has been they are mantras. They, it's basically a treatment by psychological combined with physio physiological uh, ways. So their mantras or their ch chantings have been documented. Now we, in our digitization process, have to really go down and translate that too. Now, one thing very spectacular about the Nath Yogi bases, the, the main practitioners of this magic art, is that they have converted themselves into the local language. This is because of the Vaishnavite influence, I presume, because the though Nath Yogis have different religious practices, they have lost their practices in course of time and have adopted more of a Vaishnavite uh, tradition because of the influence of you know, Bordua is not very far away. By way of uh, grow flying distance, it's hardly about 30 to 40 kilometers from my home. Now, this Vaishnavite or single god tradition, for those who don't know uh, the Hindu pantheon, uh, has influenced these people and therefore, I think, has to a certain extent eroded the very occult kind of a practice which has happened. Uh, I would love uh, these Israeli commentator from Akamos had mentioned about uh, you know the commercialization of traditions is something very important which I feel. But we in Intac, especially the Assam chapter, are now committed to establishing one that was there a principality of the in the Mayang area which was associated with the Ahum Borpukon of Guwahati. Secondly. Did they have links with the Tiwas, the Lalung Tiwa civilization, which extended in the, which was there in the in the Nelly area, Nelly Jagirod area? Are there some things in common in between these two people? Have there been intermarriages or intermixing? Whether tribal practices from those communities have been imbibed in this area of Mayong, and when and whence? has the Vaishnavite influence come in. Uh, I don't think we can carry on with this uh, treatment very long because I don't know how much of that would be, but definitely we have a purpose and a job at hand of recording these uh, chants and putting them down to print or available in translated version, either in English or maybe in Ahomya and possibly also in Hindi to establish the links in between the Nath community throughout the country and how the national influences from other regions have infiltrated into the Assamese uh, Nath Jogi community as has been mentioned by Professor Kalita. Uh, uh, Utpal Nath, Dr. Utpal Nath has been doing a very good job of preserving whatever is available and I think we are associated with him in this process of, uh, you know, rescue first, relief following, and finally rehabilitation later on. So the three R process will have to happen. And we are on the job. We seek the help of ICOMOS, especially the academia, uh, how they can help us with their inputs, because uh, it has to be a community effort and translating academic requirements into the community and the importance of uh, convert or making the community aware of preserving their intangible heritage is a very difficult job. I think it's a great PR exercise, uh, which can only happen if we can show an international interest in preserving of those traditions. That's what I had to comment on. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And we look forward to your suggestions from the Assam chapter of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Culture and Heritage, as to how to go ahead with uh, preserving this tradition and making people aware worldwide about the tradition as a living tradition. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your valuable information. Uh, now, now we have our last uh, guest uh, observer. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mahananda Bora, Principal Mayang Ansari College, uh, Mayang. Over to you, sir. 
I think uh, we will uh, go ne next. So I would like to- Okay. Uh, uh, I come to, yes, come to okay, another sir. device. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kitika. Sorry for uh, technical difficulties. Good evening to everyone. At the very outset, I would like to thank ICOMOS India Northeast Zone for conducting this international webinar on the topic magical art form and tantric literature of Mayong in association with International Committee for Intangible Cultural Heritage and National Scientific Committee for Intangible Cultural Heritage and in collaboration with Mayong Village Museum and Research Center and Mayong Ancilic College. Today we got some knowledge on this mysterious aspect about which there have many <coughs> speculation and rumors from Professor Dilip Kumar Kolita, Dr. Utpalnath, Professor Rabindranath Sarma, Mr. Sapnal Nimburwa, Deji Hajarika, get uh, uh, gives so many uh, uh, information regarding the Mayang magic. I would like to extend my heartful gratitude to them for giving us some of their valuable time. And I hope everyone will be greatly benefited from their, from their lectures. With a, my, my, with a Mayang Ancili College, also trying to safeguard both the tangible and intangible heritage of Mayang mystery. We have already organized many national and international seminar and webinars and traditional magician meets and number of training programs in our college to preserve the magical heritage of Mayang civilization. Today's webinar will open a new window regarding this conservational work. I would like to conclude with this few words and would like to thanks once again ICOMOS India Northeast Zone for conducting today's webinar in collaboration with Mayang Ancelic College and Mayang Village Museum. I would also like to thanks Professor Dilip Kumar Kolita, Director Abila, Dr. Utpalnath, Professor Rabindu Nath Sarma, Mr. Sopnan Borua, Deji Hazarika, for their words, which have greatly benefited to our participants. I would also thank Rima Oja, Vice President ICOMOS India, and Dr. Arun Menon of ICOMOS for organizing today's wonderful session and making the Mayang Ancelic College a part of today's sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Minali Nyatre, co-coordinator of uh, NSCICH ICOMOS India. Over to you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to have Dr. Marlene and Dr. Shelley also with us in spite of the time zone issues. Thank you for being with us and thank you for your invaluable uh, inputs. Uh, on the behalf of NSC ICH, I thank all the panelists and the observers for giving their inputs. I think they would go a long way in helping us to safeguard these traditions. And as I have been saying in the webinars that when the initiative comes from the local or the community which is practicing it, it reaffirms our faith that we'll be able to safeguard such traditions to some extent. But there are some uh, observations which, are, which I would like to share with you with regard to this Mayong uh, magic traditions. And that is that along with the safeguarding of this tradition, we also need to look at the larger context as the tradition as a part of the whole cultural system, the env environment within which they are performed, 
the client who follows these practices, the what kind of communication takes place between the client and the magician, the person who's perform the performer, the material which is used in these the performance of these rituals. Is it like a local product which is used or something which is brought from outside? So that would give us an insight into the trade, some kind of trade practice also. It, in short, uh, the performance as a whole. Moreover, we also need to look at how the society looks at, at this, these traditions. Uh, if we are talking about white magic, black magic, that they are kind of uh, alternative medicine. So does the society go in immediately for this kind of alternative medicine or are they uh, shifting to the modern uh, cures? And also with regard to women practitioners, though I saw some photographs where the women are were also practicing it, but then what was the extent of her domain? Was she doing only within the domestic environment? Because we know that women are the custodians of traditional knowledge, or was she also practicing it in the public as it was her counterpart part, the male was doing it. These were some of my observations. Thank you. And thank you all for being part of this. Thank you. Over to you, Kritika. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would request Dr. Manalisa Bhardwaj, co-coordinator, NSCICS iCommerce India. Over to you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I would like to uh, congratulate Northeast Zone for leading this webinar um, in collaboration with ICH and uh, NSCICH. And uh, this was a fascinating webinar presentation by Mr. Utpal was greatly effective. Observations by uh, Dilip sir um, in understanding the power of belief system of cultural boundary of Mayong area was very, very important. And uh, I have identified few um, you know, leads um, which have come out of these uh, webinars and observations on which uh, NSCICH and perhaps uh, Northeast Zone, uh, you know, could uh, consider uh, taking this series forward. One is uh, the heritage uh, component of these mantras, the tantric traditions, the effect of tourism on communities as pointed out by one of the observers that practices, uh, effect of tourism on communities that practice these uh, magic form, art form and, uh, the importance of revisiting such heritage in times of pandemic as alternate healing medicine uh, methods, um, the migration route of Nath Yogis, and of course, translation of these literature in other Indian languages. And most importantly, if we are able to continue, uh, you know, uh, building the awareness on these lesser known uh, art forms and intangible cultural heritage of you know, uh, smaller regions in Indian context, um, you know, as again pointed out by one of the observers uh, to gain international interest, which will come back and build uh, a case for protecting them. Um, I think uh, that's where we would encourage more participation from our members. So with that, thank you for your time, everyone. And uh, congratulations to the team again for putting it together. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so we have come towards the end of the session. Okay, thank you. So thank on you. Uh, behalf of, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. On behalf of iCommerce India, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers, observers, and participants who spared time from their busy schedule to grace the occasion. Today, we had an opportunity uh, to hear your thoughts and and this will surely be going to encourage us uh, in our future events. I would also like to thank uh, Marilyn and Shelly ma'am, uh, Manalisa ma'am, Rima ma'am, Arun sir, Mrinalini ma'am for your support for this webinar and to handle the technical arrangement. And at last, uh, Dilip Sankakoti sir uh, and uh, Sanjeev Borkakoti sir for initiating the promotion of uh, intangible cultural heritage of Assam at iCommerce India platform. Thank you everyone. <laughs>